Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here, and uh, it's a real pleasure. Uh, John uh, invited us to come here this year. Um, the, the conference has grown a little bit since the last time I was here. Uh, in 2018, we had it down here in the barn, and there was still a really nice crowd, but this is exciting to me to see more people that are interested in regenerative agriculture. So my talk this morning is basically the title, How to Think Like a Grazer. Uh, folks, we have some challenging times ahead of us. We've got uh, input costs that are going up. We don't have a lot of control over. Um, we've got uh, some marketing issues. You know, you've got regulations you've got to deal with. But there's one thing that we do have control of, and that's management. We can control what happens on our farm as far as the management. Now, we can't control the rain. We don't know when it's going to rain. We don't know when it's going to freeze. But we have control, and it's called management. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've tried in the past. And we do give you a real quick background. Um, we do farm in central Missouri. Missouri's dead center of the states. They call it the breadbasket. We're actually in the rolling hills. So it's a clay base, very tough environment. We're not competing with arable farmers. There's nobody doing row crops around us. And so we have an unfair advantage. And my wife, Jan, and I, have been able to put together 17 farms. And we own four of those now. And the rest of them are all east. And they're all within five miles. And so we can walk our animals. We have one large mob of animals, of cows, and then the sheep as well. But uh, so that's what we're going to talk about. So you know, we are in the solar energy business. That's what we're in. Don't overcomplicate it. A lot of people get, you know, we got to buy this, you got to buy that. You need that. If you're going to be cows or a farmer, you got to have a barn, all this stuff. And at the end of the day, we're stuffed poor and we don't have enough animals. It takes animals to make those land payments. It takes animals to send your kids to school. You've got to get invested in four-legged animals. Ruminants. Ruminants rock. You know why? Because they can eat that grass... The same grass that you and I can eat, we'll fall over dead. Those things will provide a healthy protein for us and our communities. At the same time, they're producing a calf or a lamb every year. So we need to be solar energy harvesters. That's what we are. And we also need to think of ourselves as microbe farmers. I used to consider myself a grass farmer. And Ian Mitchell Ennis, a great friend of mine from South Africa, he said, no, you're not a grass farmer. I'm like, well, yeah, I kind of am. He said, no. He said, it all starts in the soil. So, folks, we need to feed the soil. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about this morning is taking old land. That's what we get. We go out after farms that are ugly. We're leasing farms that are ugly. Nobody wants them. No fence, no water, very little grass, a lot of brush encroachment. And that's where we can use these wonderful animals to turn land around. Uh, this picture here is our uh, farm manager, Isaac. And that used to be a 20-year CRP, which is Conservation Reserve Program. You can't do anything with it. I talked the landowner into taking it out. And now it's just a beautiful mecca. I think we've counted over 80 species of grasses in there now, and Forbes. Here's 50 years of what happens in Missouri. So people that do a lot of row cropping, they get into this thing of soybean, 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 spray, 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 cultivate, cultivate, and that's what you end up with. That's cockleburr, cockleburr fields. When you get a row crop in our area, you take it over and try and convert it to grass, this is what comes. The soil is anaerobic. It's dead. There's nothing there. But with management, you can do that. Folks, that's where the money's at. The money's in the soil. The animals are helping us. How do we do that? Well, this particular farm, it took us about three to four years to get it turned around. But you've got to focus on carbon, 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 carbon. You've got to trample this stuff. You don't need to trample 100% of it. But every time you make a paddock move, go out and look on the land and see what your animals left behind for the other soil critters. Folks, there's as much weight 
in soil critters per acre underneath the soil that there is above the ground in weight in healthy soil. So we need to feed them. We have people come to our farm and say, Greg, can we have some of your earthworms? I said, no. Go get your own worms. You build it and they will come. But they got to have a home. What's an earthworm need? He needs food, he needs shelter, and he needs moisture, and he needs to be left alone. No tillage. No tillage. We have a problem in the United States. We have a hard pan underneath all the arable land that's been farmed in the past. There's a hard pan under there. And at that hard pan is an anaerobic layer. The plant roots can't bust through it. There's billions of pounds of phosphorus and potash and manganese and selenium, all this stuff is down there. We can't reach it. But plant roots can. So we've got to have healthier plants. And that's what we're focused on, is getting healthier plants. Here's 75 years of no livestock. So this is a farm that we leased uh, five years ago that had many, many animals on it for many years. And it looked pretty bad. Uh, we brought the animals in. Uh, we, we unroll hay in the wintertime. So we bring in a lot of carbon in and letting the animals do the work for us. This is a typical practice in the bottom picture. All my neighbors do that. So they lock their animals up in the wintertime, and they call that a sacrifice lot. And that's where they feed their animals. And so all the manure, all the urine, everything is in that mud. And they have to worm spring and fall. Folks, we haven't wormed a cow or a sheep for over 22 years. Why are they wormy? It's because you put them in conditions like that. Animals are naturally in tune to their environment. We need to be moving them. Think about this. Would you like to lay down in that on a cold winter night? Keep the mud off your animals, folks. Learn to hate mud. If you've got a muddy spot on your farm, don't let that, don't let that stand. And you'll get some muddy spots. You'll make some mistakes and make some mud. Cover it up. Put some hay out there. Put a little seed down. Don't get comfortable seeing bare spots around your farm. Remember, we're in the solar energy business, and you don't harvest solar energy with bare soil. Here's a, here's a mistake that I made. I'm, the reason I put that in, I want to show you. You know, we make mistakes. We're still making mistakes. There was a mistake. Can anybody see what the mistake was? We overgrazed. We had the animals in so tight that those animals took everything. Look at, the, look at that graze line. Those cows got down and raised their neck under there to get a bite to eat. They should have been moved sooner. I should have gave them a bigger area. Burn. Do we burn? Do we burn? Folks, I'll admit it. I was a burnaholic. I loved to burn. I'd get a farm like that and I'd throw a match on it and burn it. And then I'd put red clover seed down, I'd bring the cows in and unroll hay. And I always, those farms that I burned, always quit producing about June, July. Folks, you've got all that carbon in place. It's already there. Use your animals. We don't need that carbon up in the atmosphere. We need to, we need to trample it. We've got these beautiful animals. That's where the management comes in. Now, if you're going on to a farm like that, that was 20 years, no livestock. You put animals on that, they're not going to have enough protein and energy in that grass. So we call it a, a supplement. You can bring in a lick tub, do whatever you've got to do that first year to make sure the animals don't lose weight. Because you can't feed them straw. You can't. You know, we're working on a project in Arizona right now. There's nothing there. They want us to do mob grazing out there, a million pounds per acre. We're going to have to bring the carbon in. We've got to bring hay and unroll it in the desert. Here's rest. So that's rest followed by animal impact. That was broom sedge. I don't know. Uh, John, do you all grow broom sedge over here? I don't know if you do or not. But broom sedge is a bankruptcy grass. In Missouri, we call it bankruptcy grass. If you've got broom sedge, you're not going to have anything. We took broom sedge and turned it into that. Uh, this is a pasture that got away from us in the spring. We couldn't keep up. Too much rain, it all got grown, so we just left it alone, and we came back to it in July. 
So I kind of like having these type paddocks because it allows me to come back in July. Now we're in a drought, it's hotter, maybe it hasn't rained for four to six weeks. You can put cows on this, folks. Put a wire up, get them in there tight, and that's what it looked like when we took them out. So on day one, they trampled it, and that's what was left. Now, if you look in a little closer, some people would say, hey, Greg, why did you move them? Because you look up closer, look at that. There's a lot of feed there. Folks, we've got to get used to the idea there's nothing wrong with leaving soil armor. That's what that is. It's soil armor. So if you get in a situation like right now, you know, this area is fairly dry. If you had a soil armor on your surface of your ground, when it does rain, you're going to catch it all. It's not going anywhere. It's going to stay right there. It's going to keep the ground cooler. Okay? You're going to get faster regrowth. But if you leave the animals after you've trampled that, you leave them there another day, it's gone. They'll eat it. And you didn't feed your soil microbes. So let's, let's look at what happens here. So there's the grass they trampled. There's a month later. You can see the legumes starting to come up through that. And then look at that. It's almost gone. Where'd it go? The worms. That's worm turds right there, folks. That's a castle. It's a castle of worm castings. The pH on worm castings is seven. Seven. How many worms does one worm produce in his lifetime? They live seven years. 1.2 million. Now you think about that. If we can build some worms on our farm and they can start breaking all this carbon down for us and turn it into the best soil medium there is. I don't think there's another better soil medium out there than earthworm castings. There's our winter grazing. So it's been rewarding to come to England. I've already met some young folks. Well, not just young, but some middle-aged folks. They're winter grazing here in England. Uh, I've got a guy on YouTube that follows me. He sent me some pictures. He's grazing all year long here in England. Guess what? It's working. He's figured it out. He had to make some, some changes, but he's got them outside now. He's not having to haul the manure. He doesn't lose the urine up in the lot. It's all out there on your pasture. And folks, with fertilizer prices today, why are we hauling all this manure around? I wasn't brought here to tell you everything's fine. We need to change the way we're doing things. They do it in, they do it in Missouri, too. They'll have a sacrifice lot, and they'll have the big tractor pushing up all the manure, and then putting in the manure spreader, and they're spreading it in spring. It's like, oh, it's just a lot of work. I hate sitting on a tractor. I hate it. That's the, my, my predator right there in front of them. So when you're lucky enough to grow some winter stockpile, you don't give them the whole field. You treat it like hay. You give them just enough for a day or a half a day. Folks, we move our cows twice a day, 365 days of the year. Now, you don't need to do that. Make it applicable to your labor resources. So if you work in town like I did, folks, I worked in town for 30 years. I wasn't born into money. I didn't have nothing. I wasn't gifted anything. We had to work for it. But my, my dream and my goal was to someday be able to quit my job in town. And I was able to do that in 2009 at age 50. But where I'm going with that is you, you've got to have a goal. Write it down. Write your goal down. Keep it in your wallet where you can look at it. I even put it on my mirror in my bathroom. So every time that I was going through the day, I was always focused on that goal of getting there. If you don't write it down, you may not get there. Write that goal down. There's nothing wrong with dreaming big. Don't be afraid to dream. But get ready to be woke up at night. Sometimes you'll wake up thinking about that dream, and you'll start getting all these ideas. Write them down. You know, Alan Savory, the founder of Holistic Management, he keeps a, a little pad underneath his pillow and a pen. So he wakes up at night. He doesn't turn the light on. He can just write two key words to remind him of what he was dreaming. So in the morning when he wakes up, boom, it's right there. Folks, some of your best 
stuff is when you're resting, write it down. We get snow, we graze through the snow. There's a pretty good one. Um, that's a 20 inch snow. That's our ATV bailing roller. So I'm not going to bring a tractor out onto my land. I'm not doing it. Nope. Not when I can take a side by side or a quad and move a 1,200 pound big round bale and do that. So when it snows, <clears throat> we unroll the hay on top of the snow. The cattle are putting the fertility out there where it belongs. Folks, animals uh, locked up in a barn. You're kind of asking for some health issues there. They like being outside and they like being moved. They look forward to it. Uh, that's, that's cold weather right there, folks. That's 20 below zero. I know I'm using American. You got to convert that to C. I don't know what that is in C. I know it's cold. Um, there's the cows taking a, a trip down the blacktop to the next farm. There's our sheep. <clears throat> so here, the sheep, we run about 350 head of hair sheep. They, uh, they're tougher than cattle are because they'll dig. They have a small foot and they'll dig through the snow. And that's, that makes them just a really nice animal to have. Uh, the sheep are probably the most profitable animal we have on our farm. And that's because you have an unfair advantage of sheep. Our sheep are no grain, no hay, no worming, no hoof trimming, no tail docking, no shearing, no nothing. We sell sheep, and people get a band of sheep from us to start their flock. And like, Greg, we've got them out there. We've been moving them, like you said, but what else do we need to do? I'm like, don't do anything. Just keep moving them and protect them. We do run guard dogs. I uh, just got back from Germany yesterday. We were in Germany, and I feel sorry for the German people because they got wolves, lots of wolves, and they can't shoot them. They kill their livestock. We don't have wolves. We do have coyotes, and we run guardian dogs with our, with our sheep. We get lots of this. This is ice. Um, there's some more winter grazing. Ice is tough. I don't like grazing on ice, and that's why we have what we call insurance. We keep some hay. If you try and graze on ice, what happens is when the cows walk on it, they bust it off to the ground and it's gone for the whole winter. You're not gonna get that through an animal. So I would rather feed hay for a couple of days, let the sun shine, get that ice melted off, and then go back to grazing. There's another winter picture. We're doing uh, more and more of the civil pasture. Uh, we got 1,720 acres. Um, about 850 of that is grass. The rest is all timber. And so with the boys and I, what we do is we go in, in the wintertime, we'll clear out some of these really heavily timbered areas, leave the better trees, and then we bring in the carbon. That's two years right there. That was all brush. Uh, clover, that was mob grazed. I don't know where that clover seed came from, but we didn't put it down. So we like to use the term bruising the soil. Folks, you don't need the animals to eat all the forage, but you like for them to step on it. And if some of it springs back up, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> my ratio is 30% grazed, 30% trampled, and 30% left standing. That last one gets a lot of people. Third, why would you leave 30% left standing? It's a windbreak. It's a great place for ground nesting birds. That's where they need to be at. Voles. Everybody, folks, we need to slow the wind down in dry times. So if it's all flat, there's no wind breaks out there. And that wind's going to take a lot of your moisture off your farm. But people say, but Greg, you left it. You wasted it. No, I didn't waste it. Um, a cow has a clothing hook. So when they step on the ground, they open up the soil. They're chipping it with those sharp hooves, same way on a sheep. And so what we're trying to do is they call it bruising the soil. As the animals walk on it, they're waking up the microbes that are living underneath the soil. Did you all know that about 90%, 90% of all soil life resides in the top three inches? The top three inches. Dr. Pat Richardson, one of the sharpest biologists Soil biologists in the world. They call her the dung beetle queen out of Texas. She went in and took a disc. Now, she measured the soil life before and after. 
But she just took a disc. She didn't put an angle on it. She just left the cutter straight. She took one pass across this pasture, really good, diverse pasture. Then she remeasured the soil life from just making one cut. She killed 90% of the soil life. 90%. And in America, we're still chisel plowing and moldboard plowing ground. It's killing all the soil. It's killing all the bugs. We don't have any our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. It's the workhorse of the soil. But as long as you're tilling it, you're, it's a very complex system. It's got all these fingers on it. So we, we work the soil, we're breaking it apart, and we're killing it. We need fungi. Fungi can reach here to that wall over there and bring water back to the plant. Or maybe it needs a little bit of phosphorus or whatever. The plant will ask it, and it'll bring it to it, and the plant feeds the fungi some sugar. It's a trading mechanism. It's been happening for thousands of years. Anybody check the price of phosphorus lately? It's pricey. It's pricey. We have a natural mechanism that does it in the soil if, if your soil's not broke. Now, this is a controversial here in America. Uh, you know, streams. We need to keep the animals out of streams, and I agree. You don't want them in there all the time. But animals can actually heal streamland if they're used correctly. So here, we put animals on that for about eight hours. When I first leased that farm, that was all bare dirt. There wasn't any water. And now the animals, with their grazing practices and good rest periods, we've got a flowing creek now because the aquifers have got water in them now. There's fish in there, frogs. And I'm catching all my neighbor's soil when it rains. My neighbors, they don't like their soil. And so they send it down the creek to me, and I take it. All that grass grabs that soil and holds on to it because the water will come clear out of that creek and go up on these banks. And so I'm holding their soil. Learn to love your soil, folks. This is a neighbor. He was calling that a water source. Folks, that's not a water source. That's a, that's a health issue right there. If you make your animals drink that, Get out your syringe and get out your medicine. Your animals are going to be sick. And by the way, you better worm them too. My neighbor was watering animals out of that, and he used my chute about every week. He had sick animals all the time. First thing I did is I drained that, and now they're growing grass on that pond. There's water. Did you all realize that you can get 50 pounds more weaning weight on a calf? 50 pounds more just by giving them good water. It's the cheapest thing we can put in them, is good, high-quality water. We're starting to see this stuff show up, the native warm season perennials. So these plants, these are the plants that the buffalo grazed on the prairies in, in the Midwest for thousands of years. The white settlers came along, plowed the prairies up, killed it, overgrazed it, and it's not there anymore. But that's coming back. It's in the seed bank. My old friend from Africa talks about, what do you plant? What do you plant? What do you plant? The best thing to plant? Four animal hooves. Get those animals out there. There's never been a seeding done that has done as well as nature can do it. This is another one that's coming up. This is big blue stem. That's another native warm season that's starting to appear in our pastures. Uh, that's the cover crop. So on the cover crop, that's a nine-way species. Uh, we got that from Dave Brandt's son, Jay. Uh, they've got a cover crop supply business. That's a nine-way. And we drilled that in uh, July. It is, it is a warm season. And that's what it looked like when we grazed it. One of the things that I think people make a mistake in on cover crops with livestock is they take too much of it. They take it to the dirt. Because if you leave them in there long enough, they will. It's tender. They're going to eat it right down to the ground. Well, you really kind of shot yourself in the foot when you do that. You've got to leave some for those soil microbes. And, you know, to me, if I'm going to put animals on it, I've got to feed both. If you don't feed both, you're not going to have either. The dung beetles. The dung beetles are starting to come back because we don't have a mech or cattle anymore. Dr. Truman Fincher, he was a professor in Texas. He warned us. He warned us in the United States back in the 70s. Stop! Don't do this! Don't do this! You're going to cost us 
millions of dollars. We didn't listen to him. They, he had a research grant. They fired him. These big agri guys got a hold of him and they fired him, got him out of there. Truman warned us we had over 1,500 different species of dung beetles in the United States. We've killed them. They're gone. We still have some. They're coming back. But the true cost of not having dung beetles in the United States is $3.5 billion. $3.5 billion a year in lost gain. Why is that? Flies. The flies, they're eating us up because we don't have a dung beetle working that manure back into the soil. So that hole right there is the diameter of a nickel, okay? And in the bottom of that hole is one of those. That's a dung beetle ball. And so they lay, the, the female will lay an egg in that, and it's put down in the bottom of that hole. So when the baby dung beetle hatches, that's his breakfast, dinner, and supper, until he gets big enough to come up out of that hole, then the whole cycle started over again. Folks, if we had those on all of our manure pads, the fly larvae, that's where the flies go. They go to the manure and they lay their larvae in there and it hatches and then it attacks our cows. What if the dung beetles could desiccate that before the fly larvae could hatch? It happens. It happens in nature. There's one rolling across the land. Let's talk a little bit about manure pads. From that manure pad right there, I can tell a lot of things. I can tell that that cow is going to breed back. Her calf is not going to get sick. She's going to have a really good hair coat on her. The calf that's suckling her is going to be nice and fat by weaning time. And she's putting on weight for winter. I can tell all that by looking at that manure. It's because it's got that pond in there. It's got those build-up of ridges around the edge. You've got to have that type of consistency on your manure pads. If it's real runny like a sheet cake, you're making your cows graze the forage too short. They need to get more energy in them. How do you do that? Give them more selection or move them faster. Get them moving. Get them moving. Uh, we do temporary fencing a lot. We do have perimeter fences, all electric. Um, we got our quad set up to where we can do it all on the ground. Um, we went after a breed called South Pole. These are a four-way cross. They are considered a grass genetic breed. They're probably a mature cow. South Pole is going to be 1,000 to 1,200 pounds. The steers are going to finish around 11, 11, 1,200. You can finish that steer in 24 months, 20 to 24 months. The ones that uh, in the United States in all these feed lots, they're 14 to 1,600 pounds. You can't do it on grass. And there's so many people now in the United States trying to do grass-fed beef, they don't have the genetics. You've got to get that genetic, you've got to get the size of the animal right to get that thing finished. Folks, you don't want to winter them a third winter. You don't want to do that. What can happen to an animal that third winter besides take more hay? They can die. We're in the livestock business. Remember, we're also in the dying business. Sometimes they just die. So get that animal off your farm, get him finished, and get him off of there. He's eating grass that another one could be eating. If you don't know anything about livestock, and you're getting ready, you're a young couple, and you're getting ready to start your farm, look for that. Look for animals that are slick, got a real shiny hair coat. Those are the animals that are going to do well. I was on a dairy um, yesterday, day before yesterday in Germany, a uh, lady's milking out on pasture. She's got a, a portable milker. She brings the milker to the cows. And she had about 10 cows in that herd. And I went through them and looked at them. They hadn't shed off their winter hair coat. And she, every one of them that I picked out, she goes, yep, they've got the worst calf. She said, they're already on the call list. So animals that don't shed off, they're not performing on your farm. Get rid of them. And don't name your cows. I'm serious. I was on a farm in Virginia, and there was a cow out there. She must have had 10,000 flies on her. And I said, you got to sell that cow. And he looked at me and said, I can't sell that cow. That's Rose. I said, Rose needs to go to town. Uh, yeah, so we call those fly magnets. That's what they are. They're bringing in flies, and all those flies are doing are attacking your other cattle. And that cow's not going to make you any money. Get rid of her. 
just seller. Do you know when a cow wakes up in the morning, they don't ask uh, me or anybody else, I think I want to make a living for you. No, they don't ask you that. The only thing a cow or a sheep worries about is living for the next day. That's all they care about. So there's another unfair advantage. We like the sheep because we can get triple, triplets, twins. Uh, last year, we averaged straight across the whole flock 2.05. No grain, no energy supplement, and no hay for the whole winter. Stockpiled forage. See, in the wintertime, folks, those sheep, now we're lambing on pasture. We're not lambing in a barn. So the rams are put in. Uh, our spring is May, May 1st. That's when it's warm. So we put the rams in December 1st, and those rams get with it. I mean, the, our lambing season is done in about 14 days, okay? So we leave the rams in. I don't take them out. People say, why didn't you take the rams out? Because that's another group of rams that I've got to deal with in the wintertime. I just leave them in the ewes. Aren't you afraid about them breeding back? No, I'm not. They don't. Now, when we get back, Jan and I are leaving here on the 30th to get back. That's the first thing we're going to do is get the rams out. Because about the middle of July, some of those ewes will start breeding, and then you've got a wreck. Uh, you can't winter lamb in Missouri. They're all going to freeze to death unless you have a barn. And if I've got to put sheep in a barn, I'm going to sell them. I'm not doing that. Folks, sheep do so well out in the grass, in the warm grass when it's warmer out. And yes, I'm not hitting the Easter market. Everybody, you know, they, they get that January lamb and they can hit that Easter market with a, you know, 40 pound lamb, whatever. No, I'm not. What they don't figure out is what it's costing them. That you, that lamb in January, there's not any green grass. And you can't give her plain old grass hay. You got to give her fesc uh, alfalfa, something that's got a little bit more ump to it. We'll run the pigs uh, with the sheep. Uh, people are talking about the pigs catching the baby lambs. I've never seen a pig that could catch a baby lamb. Uh, they're fast, okay? Um, the multi-species thing's pretty nice. There we are going to another farm. So we've got about 400 head in that herd. I'm in the front. I've got my interns at the back, and we're doing a road move. Now, our animals are broke to hot wire, extremely broke, and that wire is not hot. That's uh, soybeans right there next to me. We've never had an animal go through that, ever. Learn to read good soil. You know, when you, dig a, when you take a spade and you dig up a big old clump of soil, there should be worms crawling out on your hands. When you, when you open it up, it should have this just intoxicating smell. It shouldn't be a big old hard lump. Just like what uh, Jill Clapper was showing there a while ago, you're not going to soak up any rainwater. And so our neighbor, love him to death, but he's hard-headed, hard-headed guy. And he goes, you know what you're doing? He, he wouldn't tell me this. He told my interns. They were out there moving a the wire. We moved 400 head onto a piece of grass that had snow on it. They all went in and they all started eating. He's sitting in his tractor cab watching that. He's got a big bale on the back of his tractor. And he goes, well, you know, you know what Greg's doing over there might work, but it would never work over here. The only thing separate, and this is the fence line. And then he went on to say, but Greg gets more rain than we do. So I'm going to mount a rain thermometer on the post between us. Just to show him we both get the same. But he's right. I do get more rain than he does. In one respect, I keep it all. And I get some of his rain, too, because he doesn't want it. Yeah. Folks, you've got to get that going on. We call that first inch right there. Do you know soil uppens? It doesn't deepen. It uppens. The more carbon we can get planted on the ground, that's called soil cheese. That first inch is called soil cheese. You're building soil, folks. We've got organic med on some of our farms now. It's at 6%. We started, we were at a half a percent. Half a percent. Grass-fed bees, we're doing that. This is a picture I like. This is a spring picture. So approaching the springtime, this would be before the leaves came out. Folks, all that dead grass out there, you see that different color in the grass? That was grass that was grown last fall. I didn't get it ate. I had enough stockpile that I didn't need it. So when I came around in what we call March mud month, I still had some of that. 
to put those cows on to. Well, we're calving April, May. I don't want my cows losing weight in March. And a lot of people will lock them up and they'll feed them hay and then they get the grain out and they pour the grain to them and they're with the calf crop. Folks, it's better to do nothing and make nothing than to do something and make nothing. If you're going to do it, let's make some money at it. And farmers, as a rule of thumb, feel bad about making money. Do you all know that? They do. Like, would $2 be enough? No. We need to price our product of what it takes for us to stay on the farm and make a living and have some money left to take a vacation, send your kids to school, whatever. We, we're feeding the world, folks. I mean, without us, I think this movement, this was so exciting. We are on the front, we are on the front lines of this thing. All the other people are going to be paying catch up. Because they're not changing. I just got back from Ireland. And they're still using a lot of ammonia nitrate over there. They're, they're using a lot of uh, plain, simple old technology, you know. And it's like, ugh. You know, you got to be thinking about this. We got these animals. We got to start using them. We got to get the animals back out on the land. You drive across the landscape, there's no animals left on the land. And in the Midwest, it's the same way. When I was a little kid growing up, every crop farm, every crop farm had a fence on it, a good fence. And they would bring the cattle out to get that manure out on that crop residue in the, in the wintertime. And every one of those farms had a little pond dug in the corner of it. That was the livestock water. Today, the ponds are all filled in, the fence is taken down, and the soil looks awful. It just looks awful. So there's a really good picture. I love that picture. The animals are on that. We were stocked at about 100,000 pounds per acre. So that's 100,000 pounds of live weight per acre. They were there for eight hours. We moved them. Look at the carbon. All that grass they trampled on the ground. They didn't get it all. There's still some left standing. And when the cows, I went out there to move them that morning, all the cows are laying down, chewing their cud. They weren't bawling. If you go to move your animals in the morning, they're all bawling at you, and they're nervously walking back and forth. You've messed up. And you keep continuing to do that, it's going to get you. Your cows are not going to breed back. I'm going to share that with you all. Some of you all may not be at another talk tomorrow, but I'm going to cover that. It's on animal performance, I think unless I get voted off of that, but that's what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. Folks, if an animal doesn't breed back, you're out of business. The most expensive part of running a livestock operation is not the feed. It's getting them bred back. I'll give you an example. In Missouri right now, I can buy a bred cow at the local sale barn for $1,500 for a good one in the spring. I bring that cow back in the fall, and I get her preg tested, and she didn't breed. Guess what she's worth? 700 bucks. I just lost $900 on one animal because I took my eyes off of animal performance. And that's what I'm going to be covering tomorrow. Folks, that's what happens in Missouri. On bare soil, we'll get a crack that opens up. That's my neighbor, continuous grazing. That's my neighbor on the left. We had a four inch rain in about, it uh, wasn't over an hour. I mean, it just like you're pouring it out of a bucket. And he decided on the left that he wanted to go into uh, soybean business. So he plowed up his land and put soybeans in it. The water closest to me, that clear stuff running in, that's coming from our pasture. That other stuff looks like a milkshake. I wouldn't drink that. That water coming off mine, I think I would if I was thirsty. Soil life. We need to start looking at the soil life on our farms. How many of y'all, when you go out and move your cattle in the morning, your sheep, real early in the morning, it's still cool, and you look out across your meadow, you're not in a drought, you've got some grass, and there should be just this array, this array of spider webs. Why is that important? Spider webs are the largest predator in the pasture. If you're not feeding your soil, you don't have a good, healthy population of amphids and all this other stuff, you're not going to have any spiders. Your soil web of life is broken. You don't, you, you've got some problems there. Winter grazing again. We're starting to do a lot more civil pasture. So we go into timber. We open up the canopy. We leave the better trees for the logs. We'll leave some young trees. 
and we were cutting, we, we got into the uh, shiitake mushroom business. I wanted to grow some food. And you get a lot of firewood when you do this, but we, uh, we unroll the carbon in the wintertime. We'll lock, you know, three to 400 cows on that hay that we unrolled, and then it, we bring the pigs in. The pigs will go in and start rooting out the stumps and controlling the underbrush. We get some lumber out of it, and there's the shiitake logs. Um, a shiitake log, if you put a spawn in it, we use oak logs because that's what we got a lot of. Um, you never have to inoculate that log again. They'll last eight to 10 years. And they're putting out about a pound of mushrooms per log. So we've got 4,000 logs now inoculated, and we get $10 a pound. So you do that math. And they'll produce two to three times a year. It's another income source on our farm where we took some ground that was just real thick in trees, wasn't growing anything, and now we're doing that. How many of y'all have eaten shiitake mushrooms? Okay, some of y'all have. I think y'all can grow them here in England. They grow best on hardwoods. Um, I don't like using softwoods because you've got to inoculate it, seal the hole, you've got to cut the tree. You know, That's all limbwood, by the way. It's not the trunks. It all grows on limbwood. Starting to make some furniture. We do have our own sawmill now. So we're, on some of these thinnings, we're, we're able to saw up lumber to make picnic tables. That's an animal that's just a piece of meat. Yeah. Never had any, never had any grain. Uh, that's all grass. And so that's kind of what we're trying to grow is animals that look like that. Uh, he's a set, that, that bull right there is 1,700 pounds. That came from Chihuahua, Mexico. There was a guy down there that raised these animals. For, he started with 500 head back in 1930. He never brought another animal into the herd. Never did. And he, found, he just picked the animals that could eat rocks and thorns and get like that. That's what he did. That's all that's down there is rocks and thorns. Um, there's the pigs out on some pasture. This is uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham. Uh, we did a soil life workshop on our farm. And uh, you know, we're all about trying to, anything that we can do to, to speed the process up of healing land. If you can get that land going, folks, especially if you're on lease land. You don't have that lease for too long, maybe. Let's say, for us, I'm not going to sign a lease unless I can get it for five years. Preferably 10 years. Uh, Jan and I have one lease. It's a lifetime lease. Um, we started working on this farm, and the landowners are so tickled with us, they came up to me and uh, said, Greg, your lease isn't any good. This is after the first year. And he reached up, and he ripped my lease up and handed it back to me. And I'm like, whoa, what's going on? Well, then he handed me back my lease money. I'd already paid it. He gave it back to me. And I said, well, I don't want that. He said, no, you're going to take it, or you're going to make me mad. I'm like, all right, I'll take it. And I stuck it in my pocket. But what he realized was that J Jan and Greg, this is absentee landowners. They appreciated what we were doing on their farm so much they didn't want to lose us. They didn't want to lose us as a leasee. And so people get emotionally attached to their land. They want to see it look like a park. And that's, we call ourselves a management service. So we'll go in and use our animals. We'll use our management. And with some of our intern power and myself, it's unbelievable what you can do. It really is. Um, I like to feed animal equipment that runs on grass. That's our deal. Here's a quote. I hate that quote, by the way. Nothing in nature is given. It is one. That's engraved in the marble on the front steps of an ag building that students go to through every day to learn how to produce food for America. We're teaching them that. In other words, unless you get a bigger stick or a meaner chemical or a bigger piece of equipment, Mother Nature will put you out of business. No, she will not. She will not. If you embrace Mother Nature and just kind of stay out of her way, kind of guide, follow what happens in nature. We don't shoot predators anymore. I used to shoot coyotes all the time. We lose baby lambs. 
Why was I losing lambs when I was shooting predators? They mate for life. When you shoot one of them, then there's eight more come in to take that one's place, and now you've got a real problem. Ian in Africa, he was shooting lions and leopards that were killing his calf crop. Every time he shot one, he started losing baby, lion, baby calves. He's predator friendly. He doesn't shoot them anymore. So we need to watch nature, what's happening in nature, and let's mimic that as much as we can. That's Ian's ranch in Africa. He can sell those. That's a kudu. That's worth $12,000. People come to hunt kudu, and so he's harvesting energy through an animal. We can do the same thing in the States. We can't sell an animal, but we can sell a hunt to pursue them. Um, that's our website, uh, greenpasturesfarm.net. And uh, that's my YouTube channel. Uh, I've got started on this YouTube thing. How many of y'all have heard about me on YouTube? Several, yeah. That, that's been a, a really good program for us. And I would encourage you all, especially on your marketing, how, you, how, do, how are people going to find you? If you're out there in this beautiful countryside, and England's got some beautiful countryside, and you've got animals, you've got kids, or you don't have kids, get, a, get something started letting people know what you're doing, because they're not going to be able to find you. It doesn't cost anything. And I don't have my phone on me, but it, all it takes is a phone. Just shoot a, a short video, get something started, get a website. People are not going to walk up to your farm, knock on your door, and say, can I buy a beef? They don't know you. And I would suggest that you try and sell something different. I was in Germany, and there was a guy up there who was raising uh, built in Galloway. Everybody else around him had great big black and white cows. I mean, black ones or white ones. He had a mixture. And they're the right size. He's finishing them on grass. So he's got a competitive advantage. He's, he can raise the best built in Galloway in Germany, and that's what I would go after. And now with this fertilizer and the increase of fossil fuels, folks, we have a real story to tell. We really do. And I think we need to, don't, don't waste that opportunity. Everybody you meet, let them know what you're doing. I, I fly. I'm on planes quite often. And if I'm sitting down, somebody and somebody will ask me, how you doing? What, you know, what are you doing here? Man, that's all I need. That's all I need. That's a short flight. It really is. And usually when they get off the farm, I've given them my card with that channel on it and a website. Now, I don't care if they come to me, but I want them to realize what we're doing. Folks, we should be proud. There's only one thing that can heal this planet, and that's a ruminant animal. And this push about getting the animals off the land, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. There's nothing else out there. There's nothing else out there that can heal this country other than a ruminant. And it's powered by sunlight. We don't have a lot of fossil fuel left, folks. We're going to pay more for it. We don't need it. We don't need it. These animals didn't ask for all this stuff. All they asked for us is to be moved. Okay? I had a, ve a vegan come to our farm. She was sick, terribly sick. We did a pasture move. We walked out into my mob, and the animals went flying past her. They're all eating in grass that tall. The birds are singing. I mean, it's just a beautiful morning. And this heifer walks up to her and sticks her tongue out and licks her on the hand. She's got a daisy sticking out of her mouth. She emailed me a year later and said, Greg, you've saved my life. I want you to know that. you saved my life. She said, the minute that heifer licked my hand, I saw that daisy, I knew I had to eat that animal. <laughs> I knew I had to eat that animal. She didn't, know, she didn't know about pasture. All she knew was about feedlots. She hated it, and that's why she wasn't eating meat. And if you look at a feedlot, there are a lot of things not to like about that. But we have this great story. Everybody out here, we're on the farm, we got the grass, we got we got the clean water. we got this nice lifestyle, a great place to raise your kids. I mean, th this is the best life there is. 
and I just almost pinch myself every day. I get to work with these young people. We got Isaac now and David and Ike. Folks, there's a lot of young people out there that are enthused about doing this. There's one problem. There's nobody teaching them. Where are they going to go learn? The universities are not teaching this. You know why? There's no grant money. In the United States, there's no grants. If you teach this type of stuff, there's not going to be any money teaching that. So I'm excited about it. There's a lot of, we have graduate schools every year at our farm, three of them. One in the spring, two in the fall, they're sold out. And now they're getting to be about 50 to 60% people 30 and under. I'm excited about that. Because in America, the average beef farmer is 65 years old. So those guys have got to fall off the perch. And this, this young group is coming in, looking at dad. Maybe their uncle's like, you know, uncle, uncle Ben worked his tail off his whole life and never made anything. But there's another way of doing it. And that's what we're all about. And with that, uh, I've got time for a few questions. If anybody has any, we'll, we'll cover some of that. Yes, sir. In the UK, we tend to have a very mild winter and often very wet. Yep. Um, I gather it's very cold and quite dry in your winters. So how, how might we adapt our no, outdoor not, grazing? It's not, we're, we can get cold, but we can get just mucky. I mean, it's so bad. It rains for weeks. And when it rains like that, folks, you've got to have some forage out there. You can't be hauling hay out onto your farm. Have it already placed. Have it already placed on a high point. Get you an up bale unroller. It doesn't have to be mine. There was a guy in Germany built one. I saw it the other day. I couldn't believe it. I think you could have unrolled a 2,000-pound bale with it. They build stuff heavy duty in Germany. Um, you've got to move those animals. You've got to have some feed out there. I mean, it, it gets so muddy in our area, you can't hardly get a four-wheeler out there. But you've got to keep moving them. Ian from Africa, I, I, I had this going on. I said, Ian, it's raining. They're tearing up my farm. What do I do? He said, Greg, did the buffalo all look at each other back in the day when it rained? What are we going to do? No, they kept moving. So you've got to spread them out, give them a bigger area, and move them. Now, you're in the winter. It's a dormant season. The grass is not growing back. You can come back around and get that. We make two rotations around our farm in the wintertime. Two. Two rotations. Yes, sir. Next question. Is another one? Yeah. Um, Greg, your grass is incredibly green. And um, in England, we talk about our green grass, too. But the question is, can you overfeed? Can you overfeed a cow grass? Is that the question? No. Uh, not the way we raise them. Of course, uh, I didn't tell you all the whole story. I was going to kind of save that for the next talk, but I'll tell you, uh, we don't wean. So we're putting pressure on those cattle. Now, not all cows will wean a calf. Some of them won't, but we haven't weaned now for 22 years. And so the cow going in the wintertime, a really nice one. Folks, your body condition scores on a cow herd should be seven before the weather gets cold. Make sure they're fat. We call that wintering the cow on the fat of the tail head. So that calf is getting just a little, maybe a, a cup full of milk each day. Well, in Missouri, in the wintertime, approaching winter, everybody weans their calf around us at seven months, and they get them up and they feed them these pellets. All winter long, they call that backgrounding. Well, well I call it bankruptcy. They just, they just gave the feed companies all their calf crop. A cow worth its weight should be able to take a calf through the winter, given just a little bit of milk with a calf inside her. She's early bred. She's not going to calve until April, May. Why are you giving that cow a vacation for? Make her work. Make her work. And they should be able to do that. And the ones that can't do that, get rid of them. You can always go out and look in your cow herd in March and find out the cows that are the heavy milkers. Folks, you don't want a heavy milking beef cow. A beef cow that puts out a ton of milk, she's going to get thin on you. That's a high-maintenance animal. The hardest thing to produce on grass is milk. You don't want a cow that gives a lot of milk. Now, if you're in the dairy business, maybe. We're not in the dairy business. So get those cows out of your herd that produce a lot of milk. And those are going to be the cows that are thin in March. Yep, good question. Um, just to follow on from what you were saying about the self-weaning, when you began that, 
did you find there was a period of transition where that learnt behaviour had to be relearnt by your herd? And if so, how painful exactly was yeah, that? Yeah, so the first years that we did no, not weaning, uh, what was the percentage of cows that dropped out of my herd that couldn't do that? Is that basically the question? Yeah, so the first year, I think we called about 10%. Uh, the second year, probably around 5%, and since then, maybe one or two. There are some cows that just won't wean them. And if they don't wean them and the cow gets thin, she just got herself out of the herd. And her calf, if you keep her and the heifer, she's got a heifer calf, that heifer calf is going to be the same way. She's not going to wean her calf either. Get rid of those. You need to pick out the cows in your herd that perform in your environment. You set up the environment, they don't. You set up the management practice, and they've got to adhere to that. If they don't get rid of them, problem solved. It's a, I'm telling you, folks, these cows that go through the winter with the calf on them, they're not getting over fat. They're not getting over fat. You know why? Because there's a calf sucking on them a little bit. The calf, I mean, a cow that's in good condition and not overly fat, the, the, the calves just pop out. We don't have a problem with them calves. And conceiving. A big old fat cow, you know what happens in nature when a cow doesn't breed in 21 days? Do you all know what happens? In Africa, they get eaten by a lion. Why is that? It's because when the lions come in to chase them, the big fat ones didn't breed. They got fat and they can't run. Nature takes them out. Nature's brutal on that respect. She's not going to mess with you. If you can't breed and stay in track, you're lion bait. You're going to get eaten by a lion. OK? Any other questions? Yes, ma'am, or sir. Um, going back to your no weaning, um, what do you, do you, how do you manage the bull calves in with the heifers and the, and the cows? I knew that was going to come up. What do we do with the heifer calves in with the bull calves if we're not weaning? How do those heifers not get bred? Well, I'm going to tell you what we've done. Yeah, it's not 100%, but it's pretty close. We don't break the mother-daughter relationship. When you break the mother-daughter relationship and wean that heifer calf, and then you throw her back in the herd six weeks later, she's going to come in heat every time. So we're not doing that. The other thing we're not doing is we're not treating the heifers any differently than we are the cow herd. So the, the heifers are not taken out. We're not feeding them whatever it is, two to three pounds, a, to make them put on that two pounds a day so they're big enough to breed and you know, all that. We're not doing that. Uh, in nature, there's nobody out there dumping two pounds of grain out to your heifers. Folks, watch nature. Uh, you know, everybody, we'll talk a little bit more about, so the bull calves, what do we do with them? We're using the testicles to put on weight. You know, the European Union won't buy U.S. grass-fed, U.S. meat. You know why? We're putting growth hormones in the ears. And then we cry about, oh, we can't sell meat to the European Union. Good for you all. Don't need that crap. We don't need a growth implant in their ear to put weight on. When they got testicles. It's a weight-gaining mechanism, testosterone. Leave the nuts on them. Now... I know in Germany I got this. They can't do that because the government won't let them. It's, you can't use a rubber band. You've got to put the steer asleep. Is that the way it is here in, Europe, in England? You've got to put the steer asleep, you know, to make sure that he doesn't feel it and all that. Uh, we're using, I've got people in the United States now that are just raising bulls. That is their grass-fed beef. Just bull herds are using bulls. And they never castrate them. You know, those bulls, they grow. Now, they're not going to have the fat cover that a steer will have, but they're still pretty good meat. So, yeah. Um, I think there was another lady. Yes, ma'am. You have beautiful animals. How do you market them, and is there a problem with slaughter facilities where you are? Is there a problem with slaughter facilities? As in, are they enough? <laughs> Yeah, so we, we have the same issue. We found out during COVID, when you put 10,000 people under a roof in a wet, moist environment, it's a good place for COVID. And that's what we have, all these big packing plants. 
And so, yeah, the little, the little mom and pop shops are trying to take up all that slack. And so we do have to book ahead of time. But that's starting to ease up now. Uh, we don't have that much problem getting into our arbiter, which is five miles from our house. Um, and the other part of your question on the good-looking animals, what was that? Oh, how do we market them? Seed stock is our number one seller. Folks, if you raise a really good, high-quality animal, slick-hided, grass genetic, 100%, no wormers, no grain, docile, hot wire broke, those animals are worth some money, a lot of money. Right now, in the United States, there's a big push for grass-fed beef. You know what the problem is? We don't have the genetics. 98% of the cattle in the United States are way too big to finish on grass. So we've, we've got a sweet spot here. We've got these animals down to 1,000, 1,100 pounds, and we can't raise enough. And we're getting, well, I, don't even, I hate to even tell you what we're getting. It's a lot of money. Seed stock is number one. So you all can do the same thing. There was a young man I met back here yesterday, last night. He's got some of the best bulls in England. I said, look, you need to let people know about these. Nobody knows you've got these. The guy with the Galloway, I told him in, Ber in uh, Germany, I said, you need to get out there. He has some beautiful belt of Galloways. Beautiful. Um, we've got beautiful South Poles, and people are knocking our doors down, folks. We're sold out all the time. We can't raise enough. The same way on the sheep. We got a one-wire sheep. Bro, we rotate our, anim, our sheep with one wire, 10 inches. So these sheep are never wormed. They're rotated every day with one poly wire. No wormer, no hoof trimming, no grain, no nothing. Guess what? We're getting about four times what you can sell them for in town. Because people want that animal that they don't have to monkey with. I don't want a worm sheep. I hate it. I'm not going to do it. So there's a market. Build the market for your farm and market them through that. If you take them to this local sale barn like everybody around me does, you're going to get hurt. You're not going to get that much money. And it tickles me when we got these big egg writers, these big major magazines, that be, like the Missouri Cattlemen Association, National Beef Council, whatever. Boys, you should feel good. We're going to make $100 a head this year. $100 a head? How are you going to send your kids to college on that? You should be making $1,000 a head. We're making a lot more than that. But it takes marketing. It takes marketing. People want to be successful. They, want, they don't have the time. There's a lot of people that have built up a, a, a treasure chest of money. They don't want to spend 20 years building that herd like ours. They want to come in and get Greg Judy right at the very start. Well, if you're going to do that, you're going to pay. And, and I don't know your name, but you can do the same thing that I'm doing. Have the very best. Have the very best. Do you know that it doesn't take any more to feed a really good one than a bad one? And I haven't been looking at that car. I've been on out of time. I think I am. <laughs> I apologize. Thank you all. I'm going to be signing books right across here.